All right, so this case number two is another radial case. Um, and uh, for this, I used that five French glide sheath slender, um, and I used a five French 130 centimeter vertebral catheter. Uh, so what you can see here is you can see the um, prostate artery uh, coming off here, and this is coming off a VP trunk. Uh, so you can see superior vesicle, you can see prostate, and then here you see your internal pudendal artery. Um, there is some reflux into the external iliac artery. Um, just kind of, again, as a review of yet from yesterday, what's missing on this picture? Anyone? The obturator artery is missing, okay? So um, this is just very common, a lot more common than I ever thought it was, you know, and uh, you can see the corona mortis here uh, on both sides. Um, so here's just a summary of um, you know, where these prostate arteries come from um, and, and the variability. Uh, the hardest part of these procedures is actually just identifying the prostate artery, which is why I think these lectures are, I hope, helpful because the more and more you see what normal things look like, the more and more you feel comfortable with what you're gonna um, uh, have to catheterize. Uh, again, you know, um, Ari said yesterday, you, you, he sat and studied you know, the night before where these things were coming from. I just had to go through lectures and lectures and just say, okay, well, you know, these are all the branches. I'm seeing these four things going anterior and it's gonna be somewhere in between those. Um, so here I got into the left prostate artery. Um, looks pretty good. Um, here's a cone beam CT showing that I'm uh, opacifying the left side of the prostate and the central gland. Um, but here's an important point, and I, I think this wasn't talked about so much yesterday, so I think it's important to stress. Um, partway through the injection, I saw something suspicious. So it wasn't there before, but it was this straight artery that was going too far down um, past the symphysis, and um, it did supply rectum. It kind of only opacified late, um, so we were able to finish the embolization. We just went pretty slow. I moved to slightly larger embolics. I don't have as much of a fear, um, like was said yesterday, about refluxing some beads into the uh, middle rectal artery. Um, the rectum's pretty tough, and uh, it, it can take a little bit of non-target embolization. The penis, I, I prefer not to do that with. Um, but what I do when I do my embolization is I, make sure that I mag up and I make sure that I turn my fluoro on a higher dose fluoro because I want to see exactly what's going on. And I don't, I narrow my cones down, but I don't narrow my cones down as much as I do for let's say a liver embolization because I want to see what's happening kind of outside that field. Here you saw partly, part way through, I saw something suspicious so I stopped and did a run and I saw a rectal branch. There's other worse things that can happen too. So it's, it's happened a few times, but partway through an injection, you'll start to see the superior hemorrhoidal artery, which is going to the IMA. And um, when you start to close off these small branches in the prostate, you're starting to open up these collaterals that go other places. So you really have to watch, and watch it under good fluoro to make sure that you're not gonna continue embolizing something you don't wanna be embolizing. All right, so we moved over to the other side, and you can see an oblique image here of the right internal iliac artery. This doesn't look like what a normal injection on the right side should look like. Does anyone know what the problem with this one is? So my fellow screwed up, and he did it in the wrong obliquity. This was actually a contralateral oblique of the right. But, <laughs> oddly enough, um, you can see the prostate artery origin pretty well on this obliquity. Um, so, you know, again, it's not, it's great for splaying out internal, I'm sorry, anterior division, posterior division, not so great necessarily at showing you the prostate origin. So this actually worked out not bad, but we still repeated it in the uh, ipsilateral oblique. Um, so here you see, again, the prostate artery uh, arising from the internal pudendal artery. Um, my, my catheter position here was okay, and I was able to get into the prostate artery with the 2,4, uh, 150 uh, prograde. The problem comes with the uh, next image, which is where when I was in the prostate artery, um, you see this pudendal artery collateral. Uh, so again, you're gonna have to do a couple, one a couple things, but for me, it was go down and coil this artery. 
um, but I didn't have a catheter that was long enough from radial. So 150 centimeters was hubbed. My five French was hubbed. I didn't have enough room to go down and coil this. So I switched out to, um, at this point, 170 rapid transit catheter. Um, and uh, I was able to get down into that branch, coil off the branch, um, and then come back and shoot the prostate. It looked okay. So the learning points from all this um, are that, you know, radial access is great, and I'm a proponent of radial access, but for prostate embolization, you really have to choose your patients carefully. You have to choose their arm length, you have to choose their overall height, um, and I'm finding more and more that whenever I ask patients, you know, how tall are you, they'll say, well, I'm 5'9", I used to be six feet, <laughs> but I'm 5'9 now, and those are the patients that I'd probably go with the six feet, not 5'9", um, because their aorta is an actually going to be pretty tortuous. Um, so right now we have kind of limited catheter lengths unless you start to get again into neurocatheters, which are pretty expensive. Um, uh, you may not be able to do flow-directed embolization just because of catheter length, because even the longest catheters are 150 centimeters. Um, and if you see something suspicious, repeat an angiogram. Stop your embolization and just do another run. Make sure you're not getting any more non-target embolization because it's not the stuff that you see initially, but it's the stuff that you see partly after you're embolizing. Um, the other thing that I uh, didn't mention yet, but if you're going to use certain balloon occlusion uh, catheters, they will only fit through an 038 inch lumen. So it doesn't matter if you're using four or five French, but if you have an 035 compatible lumen, they're not going to fit through there. Okay, so just kind of know your equipment beforehand. Um, what you'll end up doing, uh, kind of starting off, and it takes probably about 25 to 40 cases to really just kind of get things down and get comfortable with stuff. Um, you know, you're going to go through a lot of trial and error, and then you're going to put catheters in, and then you're going to say, oh, crap, that wasn't long enough, and my wire wasn't long enough, and, um, you know, the, hopefully these conferences help out a little bit with that.